Well, joining me is the Athletics football correspondent, David Ornstein, and our Chelsea writer, Liam Toomey. Uh, let's start with Chelsea and Michael Elise, and that was one of your ones to watch, David. Chelsea were one of the parties that were interested in him, but now it seems as if he's on his way to, to Bayern Munich, as you exclusively reported on The Athletic. What happened with that situation? Yeah, it was all a very dramatic culmination, wasn't it, um, on Friday evening of last week. And we signposted in the deal sheet that um, this was expected to sort of uh, gather pace. I think we talked about it on this podcast last week. Um, because I guess Michael Lise would have wanted clarity over his future. He's got the Olympics with France coming up and a new season that's um, careering into sight. Um, the interested clubs would have wanted some clarity. Crystal Palace would have wanted some clarity. And there was an element of certainty given the release clause. Um, so it was up to all of the clubs who were interested to put their best foot forward. Um, and then he would have a decision to make over which option he wanted to take. Um, Chelsea really tried to speed up the process and maybe beat the opposition to the punch because... Um, they had interest in him the previous uh, summer. It didn't work out. Um, but it got to the point where, you know, depending on who you speak to, you know, Chelsea's feeling was that the finances um, uh, proved too uh, steep for them um, in terms of, uh, I don't think so much that the fee, which uh, by virtue of the clause makes it, you know, fairly realistic for a player of such quality um, but then there's the salary and commissions that come with that then you speak to others who sort of suggest no it was Michael Elise's choice um, and then you speak to further people who say he would have been open to the Chelsea move and then more still who say no uh, it was always a Champions League club that he wanted so you know we've always got to be honest with our audiences you get different perspectives from different contacts and sources and it's our job to try and cut through that, but also to be honest, if if we don't know exactly. What we did know and we did report is um, that Chelsea um, dropped out of the race. Uh, now, exactly why can continue to be disputed, um, but it was not something that they were going to be moving forward with, which said to me very quickly as a reporter um, that there must be a direction of travel clear here for Michael Elise um, and... Uh, people are finding out in terms of the clubs who are interested uh, where he might be going. And no sooner had the, the Chelsea news um, uh, been relayed to me and we managed to break that on The Athletic, then it was articulated that Bayern Munich was his choice um, and that the clubs, Bayern Munich, who a week previously we'd reported that they, alongside Chelsea and Newcastle United, had contacted Crystal Palace to express their interest and to request permission to uh, talk to the players' representatives about a potential move, um, that they would be expected to reach an agreement with, with Crystal Palace. Um, uh, all manner of figures were flying around. I, I was told in the region of £50 million, pounds, this is going to be, you know, the clause maybe is a bit lower, but there are other payments involved. Crystal Palace should benefit to the tune of around £50 million. Pounds. We, we don't have final clarity yet because we don't have confirmation and announcements. But um, it was by Munich with clearly their, their sporting project and, and their wealth that managed to win the day. And, and um, yeah, uh, all expectations are that Michael Elise will be uh, heading to the German giants to play alongside the likes of Harry Kane and Jamal Musiala uh, and various other stars. And um, it will be a, a sad moment for Crystal Palace because he's such a talent and we didn't see quite enough of him last season because of injuries. Um, but it's been a good few years that he spent there uh, and caught the eye of so many. Um, and I'm sure Crystal Palace will have their own plans in place and their eye on certain candidates to uh, succeed him because Dougie Friedman, the sporting director there, Steve Parrish as chairman and co-owner and his um, American fellow owners, that they always seem to have uh, um, next cab off the rank. You know, we saw their recruitment in January with the likes of Adam Wharton, 
with the likes of Adam Wharton and uh, Munoz and previously Chris Richards and um, uh, the young player from Brazil who we're still yet to see flourish, um, that the, their succession planning. And so I'm sure they'll do so for Michael Elise, the same if Ebreche Eze is to leave and Mark Gehi and, um, and Anderson and so on. Um, but... In terms of Michael Elise, yeah, it seems that Bayern Munich have won the day and the likes of Chelsea and, and Newcastle and whoever else held an interest, you know, Manchester United at one point, Manchester City admired him too. They're going to have to look elsewhere. Liam, in, in short, from Chelsea fans' perspectives, will they be disappointed that Elise isn't coming? I think we're already seeing a fair bit of disappointment among Chelsea supporters. This, this is maybe a a feature of 21st century fandom with social media and and the way things work online now where you almost get lobbying for clubs to sign certain players and there was a lot of momentum behind Elise I think in part because Chelsea had courted him extent extensively last summer as well and he'd finished the the season so strongly with Crystal Palace also a player of course with with historic ties to Chelsea, having been in the Cobham Academy years ago. Um, so there will be disappointment, I think. But for, from Chelsea's perspective as a club, this was always more of a talent play than a clear football need transaction, I think, uh, particularly with Cole Palmer already there. I know the, the plan, if Elise were to come in was was maybe for Palmer to play as a 10 more but he flourished on the right of Mauricio Pochettino's system last year Nani Madueki had a promising end to the season and looks to be making positive strides in that area of the pitch they've also confirmed deals for Kendry Pice and Esteval Willian who will join next year and operate in those positions as well so I think it was always more of a case of we think Elise is so good that if we can get him, we'll get him and worry about the rest later rather than this is a player we need at a, at a position of the most need. Obviously, the, the criticism of Chelsea's recruitment um, since the, the new Clear Lake Capital um, takeover a couple of seasons back has been that they've been stockpiling players. Um, you outlined there that you know if they brought in Elise, they would have even more of a problem on the, the right-hand side uh, of the pitch in attacking areas. Um, it does beg the question, is Enzo Maresca, who's been in the job for a, around about a month now, having any say whatsoever in, in who's coming in and who's being targeted? I think he's having a say in as much as he will be part of a conversation providing the head coach's perspective on a specific profile of player that he would like for a position, what he feels he needs to make his system work, because clearly Chelsea are now heavily invested in Enzo Maresca's system with this five-year contract. They need to do all they can, really, to to make it work, given the did coaching you, turnover you, of Liam, the last years. Liam, did you just say five-year contract with a straight face? Well, that's what we're told, <laughs> five-year contract with an option to extend for a further year. Uh, Good luck to him. Yeah, I mean, Chelsea kind of need to prove that they have the patience to make that a reality. But I think in the meantime, they they have to do their best to equip this squad squad to play Enzo Maresca's football. But primarily in this hiring process to, to replace Mauricio Pochettino, they were hiring a head coach, not a manager. And they haven't assembled this high-powered recruitment team, which, by the way, they're still adding to. They didn't assemble this high-powered recruitment team, which, by the way, they're still adding to, to then be led by a coach or a manager in terms of who they sign. I think that there's still considerable regret among the ownership that they allowed Thomas Tuchel too much influence over the business they did in the summer of 2022 when they first came in. So the, the transfer strategy will not change significantly. The types of players that they're targeting in terms of age profile, salary profile um, will not change. But Maresca will will be involved in the conversation, of course, in terms of what he feels he needs in each position to play his football. So far, we've seen two players come into Chelsea. 
um, Tosin Adarabaya, who was um, on a free after leaving Fulham, and another exciting young Brazilian, uh, which has become sort of par for the course at Chelsea over the last couple of seasons, uh, Estevão, who you mentioned uh, before coming in from from Palmeiras. Just tell us about that that deal and that prospect. Yeah, I mean, Estevão Willian is the latest and the most high profile teenager that Chelsea have invested significant resources in in signing. And they feel that they've got a truly elite talent, potentially the best Brazilian player since Neymar. I mean, that's the way some people in Brazil are talking about Estevão. So Chelsea feel that the the outlay on him, uh, which I believe in, in total could reach in the region of £50 million if all the add-ons are triggered in time, is justified because Chelsea's rationale is if you wait for Neymar to become Neymar or Kylian Mbappe to become Kylian Mbappe, they are out of your financial reach and only a handful of clubs can actually afford a transfer fee, a nine-figure transfer fee plus the salary demands involved in signing a player of that calibre at their peak. So Chelsea's idea is to sign the next best players in the world in their teens and provide a developmental pathway, whether it be at Chelsea or elsewhere, for them to blossom into those players and then retain them through their prime years. Now that strategy, it's a bold one and it invites a lot of follow-up questions, but that is what Chelsea are looking to do with Estevão. It's also what they're looking to do with Kendry Pice, who I think has probably already increased his value since Chelsea signed him from Independiente del Valle. Both of those players will will join Chelsea next year when they when they turn eighteen, and at least with Estevão the plow, and at least with Estevão the plan is for him to come to Chelsea and come into the first team. You know, the, the, there is not at present any idea of loaning him anywhere or or giving him developmental time at a lower level. They believe he's so good, and come next year he will be even better that he will be ready to come in and compete for a first team place at Chelsea. Yeah, and it'll be interesting to see how he fares once he is in the building. Um David, I wanted to come to you now on a, on another forward that that Chelsea um are interested in which you reported on um who's currently playing his trade for Canada at the uh, Copper America and that is Jonathan David. What's what's the the status on on the Lille forward? Yeah, I think Chelsea have, you know, been looking at a number of attacking options, whether it be a out and out striker or um, a wide player who can sort of operate uh, along the front line. Uh, and then, yeah, the Jonathan David information, which we saw that Chelsea have um, held some conversations with his representatives, um, and the thinking behind it is that you know he's got a really good record goal scoring for club and country you know you might say that was with Lille and in the French league but the facts speak for themselves he's got a great appearance record as well very rarely misses matches um he's going into the final year of his contract at Lille and their president Olivier Letang has already said that he and Lenny Yoro have a voucher to leave they've sort of got permission uh to go this summer if if a suitable offer arrives they don't want to lose uh, either player for free in 2025 which could of course still happen um and so that would make the price for Jonathan David realistic in a a market that has as we always talk about on here um far greater supply than there is demand um and he, he has been talked about for years Jonathan David with Chelsea and, and other clubs um, but he's never moved. He is only 24 years old. Um, and I think look, if Chelsea were, were to get a different uh, profile of uh, striker, sort of bigger man to lead the line that would complement their existing options, then, then I don't think they would go for Jonathan David. If Chelsea were to, say, bring in a wide player, they've been linked with, with a number of them, such as Nico Williams. That's not one we think is going to go forward. I, I'm just using that as an example of... Uh, uh, Chelsea being you know interested in in wide players then and they managed to land one then I think they would maybe still try and bring bringing a striker of a different profile 
to what they've already got in terms of Nicholas Jackson. So maybe a bigger front man. I don't know who that will be before everybody asks. But if they don't land a wide player, then perhaps somebody of the mould of a Jonathan David comes into play because you could use them in a wide position, attacking or also centrally. Uh, not too dissimilar to a, an Nkunku or a Jackson himself. So I think this is Chelsea weighing up multiple options. Jonathan David said to me to be high among them and, and there will be others there too um you know if it was to develop then then there is a, a decent relationship with Lille because uh, Chelsea of course through their blue co ownership um have control of Strasbourg in the same competition and and I'm sure there's been some dialogue between the two clubs um but they to my knowledge, hasn't been any talks Chelsea to Lille for Jonathan David yet. So we'll have to see how that one develops. But certainly he'll be one that's talked about on the market. I've already seen other reports linking him to West Ham, uh, Manchester United and elsewhere, um, which doesn't really surprise you when you look at the options out there um, in the window. Um, but yeah, let's see if that one develops in this window or whether, um, like many of these players, it goes on to January 2023. January 2025 and a, and a pre-contract agreement to leave as a free agent in the summer um, or with some of these players you might see new contracts signed but I, I don't think that will be the case in the situation of Jonathan David. David thank you you stay there but Liam is going to fly off and we will catch up with you again very very soon thanks for your time Liam. Right let's concentrate on one of the interesting subplots in this summer transfer window and uh, the Premier League's Profit and Sustainability Regulations, PSR, you will all know about them, have just brought in an extra date which is really important and that is June the 30th and that is coming up very, very soon, of course. A lot of clubs like Aston Villa, uh, Everton, Chelsea, others working in the background as well have been keen to get deals done by this deadline and we've seen a flurry of moves for some talented but on the whole lesser known academy players to help um, make the books balance for these sides. Uh, let's bring in our reporter, Peter Rutzler, um, who's written on this subject, and he joins us now. Peter, thanks very much for coming on to um, pick apart this, this thorny issue. Um, just, just to outline, first of all, the deals that have raised eyebrows here. Yeah, so the most notable transfers in these final few days of June, of course, June is important because it's the end of the accounting year. For, for clubs that want to make sure their books are, are in order. You know, we've seen Lewis Dobbin, an academy graduate at Everton, move to Aston Villa, uh, and then going the other, other way has been Tim Urabunum, um, a Villa academy graduate going to Everton. Um, and we've also seen Amari Kellerman go from Aston Villa to Chelsea, and then Ian Matson go from Chelsea to Aston Villa, both of whom are academy gra graduates at their, at their former clubs. And there's also been talk as well about um, young Cuba Minter going from Newcastle to Chelsea. And then, sorry, there's also been talk as well about young Cuba Minter going from uh, Newcastle to Everton and potentially Dominic Calvert-Lewin going in the other direction. And the thread linking these these clubs together, of course, is that they have had their, their issues with, with, with PSR and, and, and compliance. Obviously, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting sight seeing all these um, players who, as we've mentioned, are, are very talented, but sort of moving under the radar, but also for significant amounts of money at the same time. These deals would not be happening if it wasn't for PSR, would they? Yeah, sure. I, I would argue that they, they wouldn't. Um, now, that's not to say that there aren't sporting merits to degree with some of these transfers. You know, with Aston Villa, for example, you know, they, they want a wide player. So Lewis Dobbin fits that fits that bill for their squad depth. Um but the timing of these transfers, the nature of them, and the, the fact that they are academy graduates. Now, academy graduates are the shiny card, if you want to do it, to reference swap deals. You know, they when it comes to these kind of transfers and accounting, selling an academy player um, is pure profit. There's no transfer fee that you've, you've bought this player and they've been worked through the books and, and then you're only going to get a certain amount to, to list as profit. They are pure profit. Um and of course, when you sign a player, the difference being you don't list the full amount of the transfer fee instantly. You can amortize it over the length of a, a player's contract, um, which we've talked about. And that that's, you know, that's not new. That is very, very common. I think what is 
knew about this instance because you you can you can always argue you know there are clubs that end up in financial difficulty and they will sell their their academy players players they don't want to go don't want to sell um to a rival what's distinctly different about these examples is that there are two clubs going in the opposite direction and an outcome of this and you know there's no allegation here of, of wrongdoing because the rules permit this but the outcome of this is that these deals do help their psr positions and considering the timing it's it's you know these are deals that ordinarily I, I we wouldn't see them i don't think um without this necessity um i'm sure the clubs would argue to to meet psr uh, compliance and, and and the rules as they are and david let's just uh, bring you in on this because the one to watch that you featured on the the latest deal sheet is everton striker dominic calvert lewin where does his future fit into this discussion about PSR, as far as you're concerned? Well, it was clear, as reports have um, outlined, that Newcastle um, were exploring the possibility of of signing Calvert-Lewin from Everton in a deal that would have helped solve Everton's um, PSR issue. We've always been told that, that the hole for this summer is relatively small and, and Everton have already done quite a bit of trading. Um, you know, Lewis Dobbin going to Aston Villa. Of course, they've they've bought a few players in. Uh, Illiman and Dai is one that may come in from uh, Marseille. Then there is Jack Harrison, who's returned to Leeds for another spell. Jack Harrison, who's returned from Leeds to... Jack Harrison, who's returned from Leeds for another spell. Um... So I, I don't know uh, exactly what Everton still need to do, but it's always been described to us there is still a bit of work to do. Otherwise, I'd, I'm not sure they would have been uh, looking at this potential deal that would have seen Calvert-Lewin go from Everton to Newcastle and, and they were interested at the same time um, in uh, Minte coming from Newcastle to Everton. Um, it, it appears that is now in doubt, in jeopardy. Um, we don't know the exact status and what games might be, be being played here, um, but the latest uh, suggestions are that um, it, it's not going to move forward. And, and you know, Everton, I, I suspect, would have been looking at that as a good opportunity to bring in a, a significant return for Calvert-Lewin, especially because he's heading into the final year of his contract. And as much as they love him and, and he's been with them for many years, um, you know, injuries have taken their toll. And even last season when he wasn't injured, he probably he didn't really deliver to the level that he or Everton would expect. Um, when the Newcastle situation became public, uh, I understood it actually in terms of there have been uh, rumours that Callum Wilson might be heading out of the club. And, and so maybe you bring in someone to Calvert-Lewin's um, uh, profile who if he stays fit uh, he's got a lot of attributes that a lot of clubs would want and that's why they've always considered him many of these big clubs on their lists perhaps he hasn't ever really been at the top of it hence that a move hasn't materialized so far um, but there was a, a lot of uh, feeling among Newcastle fans of why are we doing this and we don't need him and the injury record and blah 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 well um, it, it seems like now it might not be happening. But we included it in the deal sheet as, as one to watch because if Everton still do need to do some work um, to to make sure that FFP hole is filled and, and that they are PSR compliant, then you know he, he does seem an obvious candidate. We don't know if there are more clubs interested in him, but he is in a position, as we've spoken about already on this podcast, um, that there are not many of strikers, centre forwards, number nines. Um, and so let's see if anything else materialises on this, because I think Everton, of course, would be open to a sale if if the price is right. It was sort of being described to me as mid to high 30s. Newcastle were potentially going to pay for him. Um and that the Minter deal was looking at being sort of low to mid 30s. So it would have helped both clubs on a PSR basis, but also, uh, and, and this is being made 
loud and clear to me on on a on a sporting basis and and I don't think that's a cover up I, I'll take you in a, a slightly different direction Aston Villa um, we mentioned in the deal sheet that the business that they've done has allowed them to solve their PSR issues. But it's not just about that. There, there is the sporting side too. And I, I'm not trying to swallow anything that the clubs are saying. I, I think this is the reality. So Aston Villa bought in Yuri Tielemans a year ago. Uh, why? Because they had an eye on the fact that Douglas Louise this summer would be two years to go on his contract. And there's always been a lot of admiration from him for him from elsewhere um, and a possibility that that's the time to cash in on such a player um, and and then they've they've managed to do a low cost deal for Ross Barkley so essentially I think it's about 5 million for those two very good players um, and meanwhile Juventus have come in with a, an offer of 50 million euros which you might say is below Douglas Luiz's is true value however um, I don't think there were any other clubs in for him at this moment in time um, and Villa do have a PSR issue to solve. I'm not getting away from that. Um, then there are two players who are put in the deal, so Villa gain from it as well. And what you see here is a picture of um, a footballing decision and thinking that has come to fruition, but it has also helped sort out their PSR problem. And we can extend that to the signing of Ian Matson, a player that they wanted on sporting merit. Unai Emery is a huge fan of him. Um, they want to improve at left back. So let's see if somebody departs the club because they've already got to in Dina and Moreno. Um, and Chelsea have a surplus with um, their existing options at left back. So Matson's already spent a season on loan at Borussia Dortmund. There was a release clause there. Villa have paid maybe slightly more than the now expired release clause, which was specific to uh, Borussia Dortmund. 37.5 million, I think he's gone for as opposed to the 35 million euro release clause um uh, but Villa will feel that's a, a price worth paying for for a player that they wanted and at the same time they've received money f or they will be receiving money from Chelsea for um Amari Kellerman now he's a player they really like they didn't want him to go um and he was coming through nicely but the reality is he probably wouldn't have been breaking into the first team for the next couple of years and Chelsea do want him and they're putting a, a decent offer forward. And so, again, you sometimes see a, an equation that allows you sporting merit and to help solve any PSR issues. And and the clubs, again, it's not for me to defend them and criticise the Premier League or vice versa, but the system has been, been put in place that has made things very difficult for them. And some could argue that you know, get your own house in order, sort your PSR problems out and, and comply with the system. And and there are other clubs who are angry about all this trading and see it as loopholes being exploited. Um, but it is a system that was put in place by the authorities and they are acting within the current rules. Whether those rules are going to be changed in the future, we'll have to wait and see. Um, the Premier League have to vet all of these deals and, and approve them before they go through. And, and they've done that in, in all of these situations with Villa. Now, one more is, uh, I mentioned earlier, Tim um, going to... Uh, Everton and Lewis Dobbin coming to Villa. Villa wanted a young wide player in their, in their squad planning and, and Dobbin fitted the bill. Um, uh, and there was the space to let Tim move to Everton. So, um, look, a lot of moving parts. Definitely some work to make sure their finances um, are in check and that they don't breach PSR rules and face them uh, face a points deduction um, punishment. Um, but I do think, first and foremost, in most cases, uh, the sporting merit has come first and it's a combination of the two. David, thank you very much indeed. It is an interesting deadline. It adds an extra... Uh, momentum to the next few days that uh, June the 30th deadline is coming up on Sunday we'll be able to reflect on that uh, next week in the deal sheet plenty more from from David in there thanks to Peter as well and don't forget to rate and subscribe this very podcast and we will be back tomorrow with much more for you thanks very much for listening if you want to watch more episodes of the show please subscribe to the channel we'll be joined by the likes of David Ornstein Matt Slater Adam Crafton Carl Anker and plenty more through the season if you'd like to listen to the episodes in full in audio form search The Athletic FC wherever you get your podcast from <laughs>